Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is consideration of business motion 13530 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the stage three consideration of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I, and there's no, I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 13530, Minister. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And as no member has asked to speak against the motion, therefore I'll now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 13530, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And so the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion number 12916 in the name of Gil Patterson on the 30th anniversary of the Scottish Court Death Trust. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Mr Patterson, if you are ready, if you would like to open the debate, please, seven minutes or thereby. Presiding officer, may I first thank you for agreeing with the request to bring forward this member's debate from this evening to this afternoon. It has allowed a number of the trustees from the Scottish Court Death Trust to attend the debate. And I know that members are aware that we have a, a, a late a decision time at 8 o'clock, so I'm very grateful that this was allowed to happen today, uh, particularly on this day. I, I would also like to thank those colleagues who signed the motion for helping bring this debate to the Parliament in the first place. As a parent and a grandfather, there can be nothing more difficult to imagine or to in any way comprehend the devastation that must happen when a baby has passed away. From, for this to happen eh, at all would be enough for any parent and family to withstand. But, to know, but not to know the reason for the loss is beyond all natural senses. Therefore, it is with some comfort, relief and respect that we have people who understand the gravity of such horrendous human experience and aim to help in a number of ways. Firstly, they know that support of a considerable nature is needed for parents, siblings and extended family members when such tragedies strike. Secondly, they recognise that action is needed, needed to fund medical research in the hope that the cause of these tragedies can be identified. With the information that is currently available, campaigns are launched to educate and inform those who care for babies and young children with the view of reducing the number of people who experience this particular horror. Presiding officer, how does this valuable work come about? Well, for 30 years, the Scottish Court Death Trust has been in the vanguard, vanguard of doing this very work on our nation's behalf. A group of individuals volunteering to do what must be the most difficult job possible of counselling parents who have just lost their baby, many of whom are, as a starting point, blame themselves for the death of their child to the syndrome known as cot death. The dedicated people of the Scottish Death Trust ask for little in return from the Scottish Government or this Parliament other than to help bring this issue to the attention of the wider public and to bring together agencies that respond in the most appropriate way whenever this tragedy strikes. So when, you'll need to excuse me, I've got a cold, so I'll need to have a wee blow. So when, when I, I was asked to bring forward this motion to Parliament in the hope of securing cross-party support and holding this debate, it was the very least that I could do. To give time to highlighting the sterling work of the charity and to raise awareness of the counselling and support available to those in need is something which comes with great appreciation to all members of this parliament. I hope that this debate will indeed help draw attention to some of the dangers for new parents, even if they have had children already which will go to reducing the numbers of babies and young children being lost to caught death. In my own mind, I think, what is the most important part of the Trust's work? Is it the preventative element that stop, stops caught death happening in the first place? 
though funding research, uh, sorry, through funding research or from highlighting ways in which parents can help reduce the associated risk, which increases sudden unexpected death in infancy? Or is it the counselling of families who have suffered such a terrible loss? Presiding officer, it's of course both. Because whilst the education and information provided will lead to a reduction in caught death, and I know that the Trust is working towards zero, to zero tolerance of caught death, I fear that some families will need their help for some time to come. In the 30 years since the Trust was established, it, it has an important, vital and wide-ranging impact. The Trust has brought about a different approach by the authorities and, of course, the press, who now have some sympathy and a much better understanding of the truth that they never had before. Caught death occurs in every part of Scotland and affects every section of society, although more frequently in deprived areas. However, more infrequent areas, uh, sorry, more affluent areas are not safe from the heartache. Excuse me again. Most caught deaths occur within the first, uh, first years of life, but can also occur in older children. So sadly, it can occur wherever an infant is sleeping. In the early 19s, 1990s, the Back to Sleep campaign was the single most significant awareness campaign ever implemented, and the Scottish Caught Death Trust was instrumental in ensuring the implementation across Scotland. This campaign aimed to, to educate all parents and carers of, ba of babies to place babies on their back for sleeping rather their, than on their fronts, as had been the, the advice previously. This resulted in an immediate decline in the number of cases of caught death and continued to be one of the most important pieces of advice for parents. However, there is a common misconception held to do today that caught death has been completely eradicated in Scotland, so the work continues. The motion debated today outlines the key points that the Trusts are aiming to promote as part of their 30th anniversary message to ensure that parents are given as much information and help as possible to prevent this tragedy from occurring to them. Since, since formation, the Trust has provided vital support for hundreds of families across Scotland. Over the years, the support services on offer have been further developed, and to do it, today the Trust offers an impressive range of support for families affected by the loss of a baby or young child to caught death. But the Trust support, supports not only newly bereaved families, but also those who are still affected by the loss of a baby, in some cases many years after the tragedy. This long-term support is vital for many families, including those who go on to have another baby. Presiding officer, to see just how much work is carried out by the Scottish Court Death Trust, you need only look at the spring edition of the Scottish Court Death Trust News. And I know that most members got a copy of that, and I would be grateful if, if you looked at them and passed them on. That would be a, a good bit of work for the Trust. The work carried out by the Trust and its staff is immeasurable, and there are few words in the English dictionary that can be used to fully acknowledge it. But there are at least two words that I would like to say at this moment in time and on, and on behalf of the Parliament, and they are thank you. Right. And thank you very much. I now call on Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. A generous four minutes. Thank you, President Officer. In beginning, I want to congratulate Joe Patterson for securing this debate in the Scottish Caught Death Trust. Like members from across the whole chamber, I want to commend the Trust for all their work over the last 30 years as they pass this important milestone. <clears throat> Since 1985, the Scottish Caught Death Trust have fundraised for research into the causes of caught death, 
They have educated the public and raised awareness of court death and have worked tirelessly to improve support for the families who have been bereaved. This afternoon is our opportunity to come together as a parliament and thank them for the contribution they have made over the last 30 years. They are leaders in their field, promoting healthy infancies, informing policy, celebrating best practice and offering friendship and support to those families who have sadly lost a child to caught death. This debate is also an opportunity to remind ourselves that their work is not done, our work is not done, it continues and it must go on. As the Trust say on their website, a baby dies every nine days in Scotland and there are parents who will never fully know the reasons why an apparently healthy baby has died. Those parents deserve some answers and some understanding of how it has come to be that their child has been lost. For new parents and their families, for health professionals and for society as a whole, we need to do more to understand the risks to an infant's health. The more we understand those risks, the more we can do to reduce them and hopefully prevent these tragedies in future. Presiding officer, the motion before us provides a helpful summary of the key advice and recommendations the Scottish Caught Death Trust have developed in conjunction with the Scottish Government. It reminds us that the safest place for a new baby to sleep is in a cot in the parental bedroom. It reminds us to avoid sleeping on a sofa or an armchair with a baby. It reminds us to avoid, share, avoid sharing a bed with a baby if a parent has been drinking, is overly tired or it has taken medication that causes drowsiness. It reminds us to avoid letting a baby sleep on a surface that is neither firm or flat, such as an infant swing on a baby bouncer chair or in a beanbag. This is all helpful advice and it is advice that would not have been common or is widely circulated back in 1985 when the Trust was first established. I also understand that the information the Trust and the Government have produced is now available in an easy read format. That is a welcome development and I would stress the need for this advice and indeed all the public health advice to be as accessible as possible. Presiding officer, I also want to pay tribute to the donors, the fundraisers and the volunteers who have supported the Scottish Caught Death Trust as it's carried out its work over the last 30 years. We have to remember that charitable organisations like this would not be able to deliver the kind of services and assistance we are talking about today without the kindness and generosity of their supporters. 86% of the charity's income comes from donations from the public and the trust fundraising events and activities. It's the family fun days, the fundraising balls, the sponsored skydives, the marathons and the 10Ks, which ensure that the trust continues to be a vibrant organisation, not just a competent provider of services, but an efficient and energetic champion of health infancies. And finally, presiding officer, every parent and grandparent knows the joy a child can bring to a family how a new baby can change your life forever. They know the eagerness and anticipation the whole family feels when a baby is on the way. The planning, the preparations, the decoration. They know how a baby can take over and become the focus of all your attentions and emotions. What I can't imagine, but, how, but what some have sadly had to endure, is the feeling of shock and the feeling of loss that comes when a new baby, a new addition to the family, dies without explanation within a few months or even just a few weeks. My heart goes out to any parent who's ever been in this position. It may be some comfort to know that there is an organisation like the Scottish Caught Death, Tre Caught Death Trust, Tre sorry, Scottish Caught Death Trust, which is there for them. But it must be our shared ambition for the future to ensure that no parent should lose a child to caught death again. We must understand caught death and we must prevent it. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by David Stewart. Uh, let me start, presiding officer, by uh, thanking Gil Patterson for bringing this important subject to, to Parliament. Um, there are very few of us who uh, will not, uh, at some stage in our life, uh, meet death. Um, it is an inevitable part of uh, being here in the first place. But of course, when the death is of a child, of someone who is younger than us, 
uh, we feel that death most acutely. Not simply because it reminds us uh, personally of our own mortality, but because, of course, uh, we experience the loss of someone who is precious to us. Now, one of my personal interests is genealogy, and I just happen to have been going through doing a bit of a longitudinal study uh, of the St. Giles Parish um, in this city, which basically we are just on the edge of, 150 years ago. And 150 years ago, 50% uh, of children born did not reach, in this relatively well-off uh, parish, did not reach the age of 10, and half of those who died, died before the age of 1. Today, we've uh, vastly improved our care uh, and our ability to deal with a range of conditions and diseases that affect our young. So that throws into even more stark relief the sudden unexpected death, uh, often unexplained, that comes uh, under the general heading of caught death. Because, of course, it isn't one cause, and we don't always uh, satisfactorily identify uh, the cause of the death. Uh, but as the numbers of young uh, children who die has diminished, the pain and the sense of guilt that parents can feel uh, when that happens is substantially increased. My father is a, a GP, described bereavement in five stages as denial, often very uh, short, that uh, you, you, you kind of don't accept it's happened, blame, where you blame yourself for something you didn't do, blame others because things were not done, depression, and finally accommodation where hopefully you've come to terms with it and put the happy memories you've had of the person who departed uh, into some context that you will carry forward for the rest of your life. And a child, even of the briefest period on this earth, will leave memories for their parents and for all who've known them. Uh, I have not uh, been in the fortunate position of being a father myself. I'm told I'm a relatively well-trained uncle, now great-uncle, godfather, and perhaps in the not-too-distant future, great-great-uncle. Uh, so while not personally experiencing fatherhood, I've watched and stood with those uh, who ha have been parents and seen their pride and excitement uh, when they bring new life in that will take over from those of us who uh, are perhaps now contemplating more acutely than we once did uh, our own mortality. So, as the position of caught death has become more important as uh, a source of uh, uh, young people uh, not making it to adulthood, the importance of having the right kind of support in place has substantially increased. And I think that is where the Caught Deaths Trust is to be utterly congratulated for the work that they do. It, it's draining to support someone who is in mental despair, who has experienced loss. It is expensive because it takes time to provide counselling to people. It's not just a pill for a week. It's support, often for a very extended period of time. And over the last 30 years, we've seen the work of the Scottish Caught Death Trust supporting parents uh, across uh, Scotland and indeed working with others uh, beyond Scotland, I understand. And as uh, Gil Patterson's motion makes uh, clear in his own constituency, uh, supporting the next infant support programme for bereaved parents. Bespoke services, the motion talks about, through pregnancy uh, and, after the f and for the first year after birth uh, pro uh, through things like ANOC, the yeah, monitors. Now, there is one little thing we need to kind of think about. It's right and proper that we provide advice as to how we can minimise the occurrence of caught death. And uh, Margaret McCulloch highlighted quite a few of the pieces of advice that there are. But I think it's equally important that we reassure parents that it will not be their fault that a child has experienced caught death. They may have followed all the advice. They may not have been aware of some of the advice. But it almost certainly, in 99 cases out of 100, probably higher, it will not be the parent's fault. And, of course, that is precisely why the trust has to be there to reassure and support those parents who don't know what more they could have done. And the answer may be there is nothing more they could have done. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer.
Thank you. Now call on David Stewart to be followed by Jimmy McGregor. A generous four minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I place on record my thanks and congratulations to Gil Patterson on securing this afternoon's debate to mark, as we've heard, the 30th anniversary of the Scot Death, uh, uh, Scottish Scot Death Trust. I also recognise the work of Lindsay Allen, the Executive Director of the Trust, and her colleagues who have made such an incredible difference to the families who have faced such a terrible tragedy. And could I praise also the contribution of the Chair of the Trustees, uh, Dr John McClure, who I met in, in Florence at the World Conference of the Sudden Infant Death Syndrome uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, as we've heard, one baby dies every nine days, and about 40 infants die suddenly and unexpectedly in Scotland uh, each year. And over the, 30 years, over the last 30 years, more than 1,500 children have died suddenly and unexpectedly, with no definitive cause of death that can be found. Uh, my youngest son, Liam, died from cot death in 1991. Uh, he was eight months old, and I remember the horror and trauma of the moment, which has never left me. A series of images are frozen in time. The ambulance, the faces of the doctors and nurses accident and emergency, the police, and later the cold and remote manner of the pathologist during the post-mortem. All that contrasted with the support of friends, family and neighbours, the phone calls and visits, and the hundreds of cards of condolence. Many other brief parents have told me of the tremendous support they received from the Scottish Cot Death Trust during the crucial first few months after their loss. That was certainly my experience. And as we've heard, the number of deaths has declined since the 1990s, and they're now recorded as sudden unexpected death in infancy. Such deaths can occur in every part of Scotland and in all social strata. Of course, most occur within the first year of the child's life and can occur whenever an infant is sleeping. Twice as many boys die as girls, and second or later born children are more at risk, as are preterm low weight babies. What can the Trust do? As we've heard, it's invested over £3 million in research and development and has educated thousands of parents and professionals about cot death and how to reduce the risk. It's a range of resources providing support, home visiting, counselling, and befriending services. I particularly highlight the important work done with the apnea monitors and resuscitation training for parents. And of course, every bereaved parent reacts differently. Some will want contact support to last longer than others. When I meet parents through the Scottish Death Trust, they told me that having received the support, they were better able to support their surviving children and to search to help elsewhere through a general practitioner or private counselling. At times of acute grief, it's easy to forget about surviving children, grandparents, aunts and uncles, and with older children, those children's pals. I praise the Trust for its case review study, commissioned in 2000, which called for a multidisciplinary approach, given all the agencies to work together to minimise the stress to families. And I understand that NHS Quality Improvement Scotland attempted to roll out that throughout Scotland. Losing a young, healthy baby is one of the greatest traumas that parents can ever face. For 30 years, the Scottish Get Caught Death Trust has been counselling, supporting and educating parents, as well as supporting the professional agencies that work with families. Let us never forget its pioneering research work. We owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to all those involved with the Trust, the befrienders, the fundraisers and the health professionals. The work that they do is truly outstanding and makes a real difference to many families. We honour their contribution and commitments here today. Thank you very much. I now call on Jamie McGregor to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. A generous uh, four minutes. Thank you, Deputy Zoning Officer. I too congratulate Gil Patterson on securing today's debate and I pay tribute to his consistent work in this Parliament supporting the Scottish Cot Death Trust. And I'm pleased today to join other members in commending the excellent efforts of the Scottish Cot Death Trust, the only Cot Death charity in Scotland, and all those who work for it, a volunteer or help fundraise as well. Um, despite being extremely rare, uh, Cot Death or Sudden Infant Death Syndrome is still the most common uh, cause of death for infants between 1 and 12 months old in Scotland. A child dies... Um, from cot death every nine days. Um, as a father of six children myself, four of them still at school, I find it difficult to imagine the extent of the pain and darkness of losing a child, something no parent should experience, but the loss of a healthy infant suddenly 
and without explanation must be absolutely devastating and beyond heartbreaking. And that is why all MSPs should be grateful that the Scottish Scot Scot Death Trust is there to support bereaved parent constituents in these circumstances. The Trust website is a fantastic resource for parents and their families. I know several mothers and fathers myself who have suffered from the awful trauma of a cot death. Grief over the loss of a baby or toddler is so intense that it's terribly difficult for relatives or friends to begin to know what they can say or do to alleviate the grief of parents. And Margaret McCulloch and, and, and other members ha rightly highlighted this. Um, while it seems unlikely that all cot deaths can be prevented, the risk factors associated with cot death can be reduced. And therefore, like other members, I would urge prospective parents to look at the Reduce the Risk leaflet, which is very clear and helpful and offers parents to be straightforward advice on such things as placing babies on their back to sleep, keeping them away from smoke, breastfeeding, and dummy use. It appears that reducing risk factors, primarily by encouraging parents to place babies on their back to sleep, notably since the time of the 1991 Back to Sleep campaign, has helped gradually decrease the incidence of cot death over the last few decades, but we must continue to make progress in that direction. As Gil Patterson's motion makes clear, the Scottish Death Trust not only supports bereaved parents and educates the public and healthcare professionals about cot death and ways of reducing the risks, but also is committed to funding medical research into cot death, and this is to be very much welcomed. Indeed, since it was established in 1985, the Scottish Cot Death Trust has invested more than three million in research projects locally, nationally, and internationally. And we still know relatively little about the causes of cot death. And this is what we've got to find out, I think. Why, for example, are premature babies more affected and second and later born infants at a greater risk than the first born? So to conclude, presiding officer, I again warmly welcome today's debate. And on behalf of my party, I congratulate the Scottish Scott Death Trust on their 30th anniversary and thank all those involved in the Trust for the work they do on behalf of all our constituents. And I wish them every success as they continue their critically important and valuable work in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Dr. Richard Simpson, a generous four minutes, Dr. Simpson, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, Minister. Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I join with the other members in congratulating Gail Patterson on again getting a debate on this important topic? And I have no uh, negative feelings about the fact that we're debating it again. I think it is important that we continue to uh, consider this important topic. And of course, the context of of the Scottish Cot Death Trust's uh, anniversary, 30th anniversary, is a, is a, is a good one. And I think uh, join with Gil in saying thank you to them, our gratitude uh, to them for the work they've done over the years is very important. The quality of the support that they provide uh, in counselling and education uh, is obviously extremely valuable. And we commend their hard work and dedication, as David Stewart said, um, because it does have a, a really profound effect on, on those families which have been affected uh, and support them. Um, as, a, as a doctor, I experienced families with, uh, with cot death, and it was difficult. And in the, in the early days, in the 70s and 80s, um, the way in which it was managed, which was uh, by silo people coming forward, that was the health visitor providing some support. But then the police were involved, the pathologist was involved, and actually the thing was not connected up. So having a multidisciplinary approach of the sort that was referred to by David Stewart from 2000 on, I think is, is really critical in managing these situations. The police are infinitely better at this now than they were, uh, and, and that's uh, something that's very welcome. Um, apart from patients, I've also had a family member uh, who, who suffered um, um, uh, sudden infant death syndrome, or sudden unexpected death, as it's now called. And this, the form of unexplained death is the one that's really important and we're discussing today. And, and of course, differentiating it in the public mind from other things which may occur, the worst end of that being infanticide or Munchausen syndrome is really critical. And that suspicion is out there in the public sometimes when a, an infant death occurs. And, you know, when you get the sort of experience of those families, as, as Stuart Stevenson said, 
uh, of, of the feelings of guilt and self-blame, then, you know, it, the whole thing gets very confused. So the, the trust's role is really critical on this, the, 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 the educational role that they provide. There's the summit, which they had fostering collaboration, uh, is important. Getting the range of health professionals to interact with the family uh, through pregnancy and nursing uh, um, when it's a second pregnancy, uh, but also the bereavement and other counselling is really important. And I think that the toolkit which uh, is provided is helpful to professionals uh, and families alike. Th there is a lot of information, and of course, none of us forget the Back to Sleep campaign, which again, members have mentioned, uh, critical. It's one of the nicest slogans, Back to Sleep. Uh, it was so simple and so welcome and made such a fundamental difference. It seems extraordinary that it took to the 1990s for the medical researchers to actually discover such a simple thing uh, making such a huge difference. But it doesn't remove the fact, of course, that we still have um, deaths at one in every nine days, uh, and it, it is critical that the research goes on because we still don't understand it. Of course, there is a lot of research which does indicate the factors involved, and, and uh, they have been mentioned by, 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 by other speakers as well. Um, the smoking issue is still important. We still have too many people smoking in pregnancy. It's almost 20%, I think it's actually about 18% now. It has come down, and that's very welcome, but we need to go further on it. And so groups like the Family Nurse Practitioner Support, who are supporting families who are more likely to experience this, uh, uh, is important. Because teenage pregnancies, young mothers, are more likely to experience this. Very small numbers, but still, more likely, it's more likely to happen. The, the, the question of lower socioeconomic status as being overrepresented is important. Um, the, uh, the issue of breastfeeding is important. And I was disappointed to hear that the Family Nurse Practitioner Program, which we all support and feel is good, has only a 5% level of breastfeeding. And uh, I think that that's uh, something that we need to question and say, well, if this is a highly focused, low caseload uh, uh, approach, why is it only 5%? Uh, breastfeeding, when that is so important to this particular group. Uh, because breastfeeding is another of the, of the factors involved, that if the breastfeeding we know protects against infection, but it also uh, uh, seems to be less associated, or there's a, a, a lesser association, there's an association rather with, uh, with, with cough death. The, the um, other issue is just is the question of teenage pregnancies and of course the reduction in teenage pregnancies which the health committee did a report on and is welcome it's beginning to move in the right direction but there's still substantial variation across the country in the levels of teenage uh, pregnancies and I think it's critical that we actually keep on at that report it's not so far long ago that it was produced and it needs to be looked at I personally feel that there should be a school level publication of teenage pregnancies I found when I went to Oldham that that was something which was, uh, was instrumental in changing the approach to, uh, to teenage pregnancy. Schools who didn't believe they had a, a problem with it suddenly realized when the figures were given to them they had a serious problem and they needed to address it, and, and they then did. And beyond the family nurse pr pr partnership, there is also other groups beyond that, very limited, very tight group, uh, we need to consider one, uh, other families who... Uh, potential mothers who may have problems uh, because drug and alcohol abuse is another of the factors involved and we need to make sure they are supported. There, that means that the health visitors who worked previously with these focus groups from whom we've now removed the most difficult people or the, the ones most needing help, the most at risk, um, th the ones beyond that who don't qualify for family nurse partnership need to continue to be supported. So in Fife, for example, where there was an excellent program supporting some 600 families, uh, that program has, has been somewhat damaged by the removal of resources into the FNP. And that is frankly unacceptable. It needs to be looked at, and I hope the government will look at it. I hear the Positive Change Program in Glasgow has, has similarly had problems since the FNP was established. So I think that too ha needs to be uh, uh, dealt with. Um, I'm looking at the presiding officer to see if I'm still all right. You can have a little more time a if little you more wish. Time. I think the, the one other issue I want to address is, is a difficult one because it's still a matter of debate, and that's swaddling. Uh, because in some cultures, swaddling is, is the natural way to do it. It is the established cultural approach. 
Uh, it is clearly important that we understand that because it's thought that swaddling with uh, uh, the creation of uh, increased heat can actually become a factor because if the child is too hot, we know that that is a factor in the, in the situation. So actually getting proper advice on swaddling, I think, is important. And I know the Cot Death Trust uh, ha have advice on this, and I think that, that's another thing that's important. At one point, it, there was a question of whether the emissions from certain types of mattresses were a factor as well. I think that has now been addressed. But actually having the right bedding, the right clothing, the right temperature, avoiding smoking, avoiding alcohol, drug and alcohol, and not taking the baby into bed with you in the circumstances where there's any possibility you could overlay, any possibility. And particularly if the child is premature, uh, that, that, that is inappropriate. So all that sort of advice which the Cot Death Trust uh, ha have given is extremely welcome. And I hope that they will not have to go on for another 30 years, that we will find a solution, we will find an understanding. But in the meantime, the programme which they run in, in educating the public in general, but also in supporting families who have been bereaved in this way, has been welcome, is critical and has to be supported. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Minister Maureen Watt to close this debate on behalf of the Government Minister. You have until two o'clock, if you wish. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, and I'd like to thank Gil Patterson very much for bringing this uh, debate today. I notice uh, in the records that five years ago he brought a similar debate, recognising a quarter of a century of the Scottish Court Death Trust. So I join with all the other speakers today in congratulating the Scottish Cot Death Trust on their 30th anniversary and acknowledge the important work that Lindsay Allen, the di Executive Director of the Trust, all its trustees, its staff and its many volunteers, past and present, have done over the last 30 years in supporting families who have lost their babies or young children to sudden and un unexplained death in infancy. And I welcome all the points that have been made um, by the speakers. Presiding officer, any bereavement, as has been said, is traumatic. However, the effect of a sudden and unexpected death of a baby has a devastating impact on the family, which is why the support offered by the Trust is necessary and greatly appreciated by the bereaved families affected. Interestingly, just last night in this Parliament, there was an event um, celebrating the work, the 10th anniversary indeed, of the Simpson Memorial Box Appeal. Um, and there were some very harrowing stories and many tears uh, last night at that event, which just brought home how uh, devastating uh, such a death can be. As members have mentioned, thankfully in recent years, there has been a, a seen a reduction in the number of sudden unexplained deaths in infancy. Until 1991, around 50 babies a year died in Scotland. This has gradually decreased to around 30 babies a year. Clearly, even one death is, far, is too many, but the trend is thankfully in the right direction. And figures from the National Records of Scotland for 2013 and provisional figures for 2014 show a potential further drop in numbers, and this is to be welcomed. And experts believe that this reduction is due to the advice given to parents to place babies on their backs to sleep. And as Dr. Simpson mentioned, it was just such a simple message. Supporting families has been and still is a fundamental aspect of the Trust's work. And most recently, it has introduced the Scottish Coordinator role, which offers assistance to boards in conducting sudden infant death reviews where required. Also, the next infant support programme, where the Trust offers to work with each of the Sudi paediatricians across Scotland to ensure that when bereaved parents are expecting a new baby, they will see, receive extra care and support during the pregnancy and after the birth. The Scottish Cot Death Trust also receives Section 16B funding from the Scottish Government. That was £15,000 in 2014-15, and that was for sleep apnea monitors, and it will receive a total of 120,000 over three years for their support post. The Scottish Government Sudi Group was established in December 2012 
of which the Scot Scottish Court Death Trust is an active participant. This group was set up to take a fresh look at this important area of work. In particular, the group has considered how best to ensure that SUDI reviews are fully completed and looked at how to drive improvement locally and nationally. The SUDI multi-agency toolkit, currently hosted by Healthcare Improvement Scotland, was set up and provides web-based guidance on the correct procedures in the event of a sudden unexplained death in infancy. And that developed a standardised pathway and SUDI review process for all boards to follow when investigating a sudden unexplained death in infancy. And this SUDI review process and toolkit has been used since, since 2011. And NH bo NHS boards now have full responsibility for undertaking SUDI reviews. And of course, it's not just professionals from NHS boards who are involved in the management of SUDI cases, but also Police Scotland, the Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal, Ambulance Service may be involved, and often, of course, child protection colleagues. And the information sharing processes between the different agencies is critical. And the Scottish Government SUDI group has al also considered the information gathered from the SUDI review process and will consider further data analysis to drive more quality improvements of the process and improve the care and information provided to families who have been devastated by tragic losses, of course. Stuart Stevenson. Um, the, the Minister has been talking quite properly about the wide range of professional support and of course the uh, Cot Desk Trust musters much of that to, to help those who are affected by that. But is it not also the case that uh, those who have experienced uh, sudden infant death syndrome are often those who are most valued by later sufferers because of course they bring personal experience to it? Um, that often is at least as valuable as the professional input that comes uh, from the wide range of people who are involved in the trust and, and in the whole uh, issue. And this is a, a feature of the third sector very generally, of which the Scottish uh, Infant Death Trust is uh, a, a good example. Minister Maureen Moore. Um, I thank the member for that intervention, and I absolutely agree with him um, that peer support is so crucial not just in this area of work, but in so many uh, uh, aspects of the work that I under undertake and the visits I make to uh, various organisations. You learn so much more and have so much more empathy with someone who has been through the same experience as you. And indeed, in the last two years, there have been two SUDI summits, which have been joint Scottish De Death Trust um, and the Scottish Government events. And the most recent summit, which I opened, took place in December 2014 and was an excellent day of sharing best practice with the common goal of assisting bereaved families who experience SUDI. The Scottish Government set up Child Death Reviews Steering Group this year and the Trust has a representative on this important group, ensuring the perspective of bereaved parents is heard. The Child Death Reviews Steering Group will provide a report to ministers in the summer setting out their recommendations for a child death review process. As other speakers have mentioned, the cause of SIDS is not known. It is possible that many factors contribute, but some factors are known to make SIDS more likely. And these include placing a baby on their front or side for sleep. We also know that the risk of SIDS is higher in cases where babies are born preterm with low birth weight, where the mother smokes over 20 cigarettes a day when pregnant, or in families where there is a socio-economic de deprivation or complex needs. And I think, as Dr. Simpson said, um, looking at where the breastfeeding rates can go up, that shows that there's less likelihood of sudden death. And if we can tackle more, we're making good progress with teenage pregnancies, but more needs to be done. So the NICE guidelines on postnatal care were updated in 2014 and they agree and with all this. We, we need clear evidence to say that one particular factor directly causes SIDS. Nice evidence, nice reviewed evidence re relating to co-sleeping, parents or carers sleeping on a bed or sofa, or a chair indeed with an infant in the first year of an infant's life. Some of the reviewed evidence showed that there is a statistical relationship 
between SIDS and co-sleeping. However, NICE was clear that the evidence does not show that co-sleeping causes SIDS. Therefore, the term association has been used in the recommendations to describe the relationship between co-sleeping and SIDS. Mm, NICE recommends time, the healthcare professionals should inform parents and carers that the association between co-sleeping uh, and SIDS may be greater <clears throat> if there has been alcohol consumption or drug use or low birth weight or premature infants. So in closing, uh, presiding off, well, um, I should also mention the reduce the risk leaflet, which is given to every mother uh, antenatally or fo following delivery. So in closing, I'd like to acknowledge again the work done by the Scottish Court Death Trust and wish the organisation continued success in the future, supporting families affected by sudden unexpected death of a child or baby. Thank you. Many thanks. And thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now allow a moment or two for um, change of places for ministerial, and then we'll move on to portfolio questions.